Hello, my name is Matt Strelo from Stanford University. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about our approach to the undifferentiated patient. When you walk up to a patient's bedside, whether it's in the emergency department, in the clinic, or in the hospital, and you don't know that patient, you have to rapidly decide what to do in that patient and if that patient is sick or not. What we're going to focus on then over the next two lectures is to define the emergency medicine approach to undifferentiated patients because emergency medicine physicians and staff spend the vast majority of their time evaluating patients that have a potential critical illness and they have never seen before. And so they are really experts at this. And then we're going to learn a systematic, systematic method for evaluating critically ill and undifferentiated patients. The traditional approach to evaluating and managing a patient that you learn in medical school or in training is that you evaluate the patient getting a full history and physical examination. You then think about the patient, develop a differential diagnosis and what you want to interventions and what further studies you want. And then you act on those interventions and get those studies. This is effective, but it's slow. And in our potentially sick, undifferentiated patient, we want to do these things simultaneously, where we evaluate, think, and act all at the same time. And this is the emergency medicine approach to patients. When we say evaluate, what do we mean? Well, we want to get an initial assessment. And that initial assessment should include the general appearance and the level of consciousness, an evaluation of their airway, their breathing, and their circulation, so their ABCs. And then I like to get a complete set of vital signs as well. When I look at their general appearance and level of consciousness, what I'm trying to determine is, are they ill-appearing or do they have an altered mental status? And so when I look at their general appearance and I'm walking up to the bedside, I try to decide, does the patient look chronically ill or do they look that at baseline they're generally healthy? And then I look for signs of things like anxiety, sleepiness, respiratory distress or fatigue, and sweatiness. When I look at their level of consciousness, the fastest way to do that is to actually introduce yourself. So say something like, hello, my name is Dr. Stralo. What's your name? If the patient responds appropriately, you have a pretty good um, understanding of what their mental status is. If they don't respond appropriately, at that point I do some kind of noxious stimuli like shake their shoulders or do a sternal rub to assess if they're responsive to painful stimuli. And then I decide where they're at on the AVPU scale, which stands for alert, so the patient is looking around and interacting with their environment. If they're not doing that, do they respond to verbal stimuli? So they might look sleepy, but when I speak to them, they respond appropriately. Do they only respond to painful stimuli, or P, or are they unresponsive to any form of stimuli? And that helps me determine approximately how, uh, where they are at from their baseline. Now, I move on then to airway. And what I want to learn in airway is, is their airway obstructed or not protected, or is it normal? And once again, the simplest way to do that is to ask the patient to state their name. If the patient is able to speak clearly, they generally have an intact gag reflex and a clear airway. If they are not able to speak, then you need to check a little more closely their airway and make sure that it's open. Any unprotected airway should be uh, handled immediately with some basic and advanced airway maneuvers. So how are you going to check for an unprotected or obstructed airway? One of the best things to do is to start by just listening. Do you hear any gurgling, strider, or snoring? And then take a look in the back of the throat, looking for things like pooled secretions or blood, any foreign bodies. I also check a gag reflex, and I use a tongue depressor, or potentially even better, a suction catheter, by touching that to the tonsil or to the uh, posterior part of the tongue to see if the patient actually will gag, and then I look for signs of cyanosis. Take a listen to this child.
What you can hear and what you see is that the patient clearly has strider, so their airway is not normal. And so you're gonna to want to initiate some basic airway maneuvers right away when seeing this patient. You can also see, just on initial look, this patient also is having a lot of retractions and difficulty breathing. So their breathing is affected by their airway problem. So as we move from A to B, or breathing, we want to determine, is their breathing normal or is it distressed? And again, the simplest way to do that is to ask the patient just to talk to you. And while that patient's talking, if they're able to speak in complete sentences, that's generally a sign that their breathing is okay. If they have to stop every few words to take a couple of breaths, that implies that the patient's breathing is abnormal. And we want to consider some immediate interventions like oxygen or positive pressure ventilation. What other signs of respiratory distress besides difficulty talking should we look for? Well, I like to look at the rate. Is it rapid or slow? The depth of breathing, are they breathing very deep so they're trying to blow off a metabolic acidosis? Or are they breathing very shallow due to pain or other causes? What's their effort? Are they working very hard to breathe or are they actually starting to fail to breathe because they've now become fatigued? And then finally, after I've done these other things, then I listen to breath sounds. And I listen, are the breath sounds equal? Is one side decreased? Are there crepitations, also known as crackles? Are there any wheezes? Take a look at this patient and their breathing. Now, without even using your stethoscope, you can see right away that this patient has significant respiratory distress. He's using his accessory muscles, both his shoulders and his abdomen, to take deep breaths. And the team has appropriately put on positive pressure ventilation for this patient. But that patient wasn't breathing as hard as you would expect for someone like that because they're getting tired. So this patient was fatiguing even with that positive pressure ventilation and eventually had to be intubated. So you want to recognize that fatigue early so that you can intervene before they completely are unable to breathe. As we move from B then we move on to C or circulation. And we're going to check for a weak or absent pulse. And the place I like to check is I like to start in a radial or a peripheral pulse. So in a child, I might, a very young child, I might check a brachial pulse. But for everybody else, I start with a radial pulse. If the radial pulse is present and strong, that generally indicates that you would have good perfusion of all the vital organs. If the radial pulse is absent, I quickly move then to checking a central pulse. And I normally go directly to the carotid pulse. If the carotid pulse is absent, you're going to immediately think about things like CPR, depending on the rest of the patient's condition. Or if it's weak, you're going to think about things like IV fluid and putting that patient on a cardiac monitor. So you can quickly check circulation by just evaluating the pulses. And then finally, after I've finished the ABCs and done any immediate interventions, I then am going to do a full set of vital signs. And the thing I like to remember about vital signs is to obtain them early, to get all of them, and to do them often, meaning to repeat them if they're abnormal or I perform any interventions to make sure that that patient's condition is not changing. And one of the vital signs that you frequently don't see obtained in, in resource limiting settings is the oxygen saturation. Because traditionally, oxygen saturation monitoring has been expensive. But more recently, buying an O2 sat probe that runs on basic batteries can be obtained for as little as $20 US currency and is, can be used in thousands of patients. So even in resource limited settings, oxygen saturation should be used. When you get vital signs, make sure that they're age appropriate. The vital signs you would expect in children of different ages are much different than what you would expect in an elderly patient. So have a table or a chart to refer to. Another pitfall that I frequently see in trainees and junior attending physicians is to ignore or discount abnormal vital signs. This is an, a very easy way to make a mistake. When you see an abnormal vital sign, you should in, immediately try to determine what the cause of that abnormality is. And if you can't explain it, assume that that patient is sick until other until proven otherwise. 
as we're evaluating the patient, we're going to be thinking about the patient during our initial assessment because we're doing things simultaneously. And what you want to be asking yourself is, is the patient obviously sick? And the way I would determine that is by looking at my initial assessment. If there's anything abnormal on my initial assessment, the answer is generally yes, the patient is obviously sick, so I'm going to begin my actions. Remember that patients that may not initially have abnormalities on their initial assessment may still have a serious medical condition, but they're just not unstable at this time. Now, what are the immediate interventions that you're going to perform in these patients? Here's a list that's not complete, so there are other ones that you could perform, but these are the more common ones. And some of them are performed in almost all patients that are unstable or obviously sick. Things like positioning the patient, applying oxygen, putting the patient on a cardiac monitor, and placing an IV or getting a, someone to start that process. Other things such as controlling bleeding and CPR will be dependent upon the patient's condition. Another pitfall to watch out for is that when you find an abnormality on the initial assessment, don't wait until you've completed your entire initial evaluation to begin your interventions. Remember, we're doing things simultaneously. So if you find an airway problem, you should perform stabilization interventions immediately prior to moving on to B and C. So the emergency medicine approach, we're going to evaluate and think and act simultaneously, looking at things on our evaluation like the general appearance, level of consciousness, ABCs and the vital signs. We're going to ask ourselves, is this patient obviously sick? And if they are, we're going to perform our, any immediate interventions to stabilize that patient. Thank you.